Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Good Tips for Hard Times, where we find smart people who have great advice to help you get through your days. Thank you so much for joining us again. I'm Jay Lynn. I am the programs manager for the Games Hotline, Games and Online Harassment Hotline, which is a new emotional support resource for anyone who makes or plays games. I am so excited to have uh, the guest we have this week. Um, Throughout her career, Dr. Christine Moutier has focused on training healthcare leaders, physicians, and patient groups in order to change the healthcare system's approach to mental health, fighting stigma, and optimizing care for those suffering from mental health conditions. In addition to co-founding the American Foundation Suicide Prevention's San Diego chapter, Moutier, Dr. Moutier co-led a successful suicide prevention and depression awareness program for health science faculty, residents, and students. She is currently the chief medical officer of the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention. Thank you so much for joining me today, Christine. I'm really excited for this conversation. Thank you, Jay. It's great to come on and get to talk about real life and um, the importance of mental health and how we can all support each other. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention this month of September is doing um, a campaign called Keep Going. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So every year in September, um, it is National Suicide Prevention Month. And for this year, because we're six months into COVID, it's a different time for all of us. We landed on this campaign that uh, called Keep Going that really acknowledges that we're all in different stages of um, facing change and uncertainty and all kinds of different challenges. And so Keep Going is, um, is really a message to try to acknowledge that, be sort of authentic with that, and um, encourage dialogue among all of us about you know, how we do that and how do we encourage one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is such a powerful message, as you said, like, especially this year with um, I, I'm definitely feeling recently that um, the the newness of the, you know, that that caution alert of like, OK, I need to be really careful. And this is really serious. That kind of newness energy has worn off. And yet there isn't and quite an end in sight. We're quite not sprinting to the finish line yet. Um, so I, I definitely uh, feel feel that message, and that's that's really really awesome. Um, so we want to talk about we we want to talk about suicide today. We want to talk to talking talk about talking to friends about suicide today. Um, you know, I think normally whenever whenever I see kind of the suicide prevention or suicide awareness stuff, um, or maybe there's a high profile suicide in the news and, and people are uh, trying to spread awareness about suicide, it, I, I often see that um, some of the, uh, some of those, like, I guess, awareness campaigns end with like, all right, well, if you're, if you're struggling, reach out, like, don't, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, and kind of, um, can can sometimes feel like it's it's just left there. Uh, so I kind of want to take it a step further um, in, in similar to the ways that ASFP, um, the AFSP, sorry, mm -hmm. um, does with, with your Keep Going campaign and your hashtag Real Convos um, stuff of like, how, so how do we actually reach out? So say we, um, say we have a friend who we recognize is, is showing some signs that you know they're maybe kind of hinting at or um, calling for help in some some certain ways um, that we recognize as a friend. Like, okay, maybe something's not okay. Maybe they're thinking of killing themselves. How how could we actually reach out to those friends? Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up because um, we've learned that among people of all ages actually, but especially among younger adults and um, and even teens, like they're, they actually identify so strongly with their role in their friend group as being like, a, a, you know, that, that, the, that the identification as a friend is important to them. Um, they feel mm -hmm. like a sense of commitment to, to their friends. And they oftentimes have some hints when their peers are struggling. Um, and so I will say it can actually be something that we learn how to do just as a matter of um, 
really more in a way normal times in the sense that you don't have to really be worried necessarily that they're thinking of suicide, but just any indication that they're facing a hard thing in their life and they're going through something. I mean, in a way, like who isn't going through something most of the time these days? And so in that sense, it's about approaching your friend with a caring conversation, with with a way for them to know that you want to support them and not judge them for anything they're experiencing. Because remember, when you're the one in distress, you tend to actually heap a lot of like shame, oddly, or um, you know, feeling like maybe you're doing things wrong or people are mm. judging you in some way. So that like just expressing, hey, I want to connect with you because I want to support you. No judgment. I want to learn more about what it is you are going through and experiencing. And, and if possible, to just open up a dialogue like that where they actually get to share more, that is really the goal. So it's really actually more about like active listening skills at mm. that point and less about, and in fact, really we, we advise, there's no need to like go into solution, problem solving mode or quick fixes. These are not, that's not the way these, um, especially mental health, but, but most circumstances are not really about quick fixes. They're about being validated, heard, um, and knowing that they have support and you know just think about the way you feel when when someone actually is seeing you hearing you and acknowledging i mean even that alone is a is a very powerful thing for all of us yeah that that makes a lot of sense i think i think what you say about um yeah creating just like a non-judgmental uh space for them to talk about whatever they're going through or um yeah, not not pretending like you're coming in with a solution. Um, that that definitely sounds like a really freeing conversation to have with someone who might be struggling and feeling vulnerable in that moment. Um, and I should add that it's okay, absolutely, actually encouraged if you have reason to believe that they're really overwhelmed or feeling hopeless. And it might not be that they use those words, but that's their tone and that's the mm -hmm. the sense you're getting. It's, it's actually a really um, important thing. It could, it could be a very important moment for you to say, hey, you know, when, when some people feel that, and you can even use their words, that stressed out or whatever it is they've said, mm -hmm. um, sometimes they might have thoughts of ending their life. Is that something that you've thought about or you've experienced? And again, just at that point, try to be quiet and listen. And, and it's and it's okay if they say, you know, however they respond is is all good and your job is just to listen. You you do not need to be a mental health professional. You're and, and also, by the way, if somebody is having thoughts of suicide, it doesn't mean that they are about to act on them. In fact, there are probably around between 10 and 15 percent of people around us at all times who are having thoughts of suicide. That, right. That's the prevalence of, you know, the, sometimes that there's, they're serious and ongoing and sometimes it's just a fleeting thought. So don't assume that you have to drop every, everything and call 911. In fact, um, it's more important actually to just express concern about that, allow them to talk more. And, and if they are having thoughts of suicide, it does indicate a level of distress, though, that we absolutely would encourage them taking that step to seek out like some type of health professional, ideally a therapist or a psychiatrist, but even like their family doctor um, mm -hmm. would be great. And, and some people feel more comfortable taking it to a pastor, a mentor, a parent, um, but and, and all of us. Whether whatever role you're in in that relationship, we can all play an important role of supporting that individual. Just like you know, if your if your friend told you they were going through, I don't know, any other kind of health situation, you would you would check in on them on occasion, like mm -hmm. depending on what the circumstance. And it's the same thing with mental health. We can be like that that caring community around mental health issues as well. Right. Um, I think that's. I think that's a that's a hard place to be, but I think it's important um, to to make sure that our responses to whatever our friend says uh, when we have this conversation are okay and <laughs> and valid. Um, even if our even if the friend says, "Yes, I'm thinking about killing myself," um, 
and and yes, I'm yes, I'm really gonna do it, or yes, um, however they are feeling, um, to really to really hear that and and hear that they are really suffering, but to to not then turn it around and kind of uh, maybe you know by accident recenter our own reaction to it um, or um, kind of maybe maybe freak out or panic and then make them take care of us, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that that's a great way of putting it because that's, you know, it is, it's sort of like managing your own reaction and your own anxiety so that you can really just be there for the person. Mm -hmm. And and that is a time, you know, you mentioned the, you know, if you're in distress, reach out. That is a time where if you're the friend caring for somebody in that moment and you really are like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. It sounds serious. Um, and, and there's, you know, I, I'm not sure where to take this. That is a moment where together you could text, um, mm -hmm. the crisis text line. Um, you could call the games hotline, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you could call the national suicide prevention lifeline. All of those are awesome resources where you can even get guidance as the helping friend, um, ideally the person is engaged in that, but you could also just be calling them saying, I don't know what to do and here's the situation and they'll give you some recommendations. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, doing like, uh, doing those things kind of not necessarily on behalf of, uh, the friend who is really struggling, but, um, even, even for, for kind of your own mental health and your own care, uh, to get some support around that because, uh, you know, that <laughs> that kind of secondary distress is very real, you know, even just just hearing about someone you care about so deeply go through all these, uh, you know, possibly painful or traumatic things can, can really weigh, weigh on your, yourself. So that's a really, really good point. Um, I guess to, to kind of flip it now, um, what if, what if, what if I am the one who is feeling suicidal and um, maybe maybe some friends have uh, indicated that, you know, folks can reach out to them, um, but that's still a really scary thing to do. Um, what, I guess, what, what are some good first steps for someone um, when maybe they haven't talked about how they're feeling with anyone else yet? Um, some good steps to kind of maybe feel feel safer um, and feel more confident in reaching out that first time. Yeah, you know, this is so important um, because the, the natural instinct we will have is to just keep it to ourselves because all of these unknown factors, but, but I am here to tell you, number one, you're not alone. And if there are those trusted people in your life, which like you said, Jay, many times people will will kind of establish themselves as as one of those safe supportive people by other ways that you've seen them react um you know it, with support with love with unconditional love um with just reach outs and checking in that's the kind of person that i think is is best poised to be able mm. to um you know have the best uh outcome when you do reach out to them and, and I would kind of help them understand when you do the reach out um, to say, I'm hoping to, you could even say, like, schedule some time with you to share something um, very important that, that's been going on with me. Some way to alert them that this isn't like, you know, um, something for them to just kind of brush off, but like, <laughs> I'm on alert, like, there's been something going on with me. Um, and I, I'd love to talk with you privately about it. I think all those kinds of key words, privately and important, mm -hmm. I want to share something with you, um, will help them clue into like, this is like this kind of, um, you know, a, a conversation I need to like really pay attention to and prioritize. And so I think there are ways to set it up so that you're, you're like helping your friend in a way, um, or your right. mentor or parent, whoever it is in your life, to be kind of like ready for some full attention, active listening skills, you know, employed in this conversation. And, and then, you know, I think you can say to them even up front, I'm not 
sharing this with you, expecting you to, you know, solve it or anything like that. I think it might just help me to connect with somebody about what I've been going through. And so it's really just listening and support. You, you can define it, what you need from them, or you mm. might actually need something concrete. And if you do, that's fine too. Like maybe you've been trying to find a therapist and it's not working. And, and that is something like very practical that the, the person could actually help you with. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm hearing that like, um, in, in both of these that, uh, being kind of more direct in our in our asks and in our communication mm -hmm. might be some of the keys here, even though uh, I, I know that's something that some folks might struggle with and, <laughs> and might need to scrounge up some courage for. But um, that that makes a lot of sense to just not just but to to really ask for what we need um, and ask ask kind of directly to what we what what our concerns are with someone or with ourselves. Um, speaking of that directness, um, do you, so when it, cause I think suicide can feel like an intense topic or an, an intense even accusation if you're asking someone else mm. or an intense vulnerability to, to, to open yourself up to. If, if I say I'm suicidal, how will people react? How will, will they call the cops on me? Will they send me to the hospital right away? I think those are really common fears. Um, do you, do you recommend asking directly and saying those things directly? Yeah, I, and I get exactly where you're going with this there. Um, the, the world is changing in some good ways but it hasn't always been the case that you would receive just full support and unconditional love. There, there have been incredible stigmas and, um, you know, discriminatory stuff that has gone on. I, I do want to tell you that what, what we, we actually just did a national survey and actually asked these kinds of questions mm. um, about people's beliefs and attitudes and their sense of confidence to have these conversations. And, and I will tell you, the world is changing in the right ways. The vast majority of people say, I would want to know and I would want to support a friend or loved one if I knew that they were struggling or having suicidal thoughts. Um, and, and as far as like, you know, getting the police involved, what, what we are actually advocating for at AFSP is that the crisis response system in our nation needs to move away from law enforcement because you think about it if somebody's having a heart attack it's not police who show up it's health trained um, emergency right. support people and so in some communities this already exists where there are mental health crisis teams that will actually be the ones to show up um, if you call 911 and it is a question of suicide or a different you know kind of mental health crisis but that's not available in every community yet um, mm -hmm. So again, what I would say is if you're the person um, and you're worried about something like that and you're not sure the sort of sophistication of the person you're reaching out to, um, if it's true, I would absolutely tell them, I'm really struggling and I, I have had thoughts of taking my own life, but it has not progressed to a point of actually jeopardizing my safety at all. Like I'm not, I haven't gone to any sort of planning stage with this. It's just that sometimes I feel so overwhelmed. I mean, you can just describe the experience of it. Mm -hmm. So you can give them, you know, enough information that hopefully lets them know these are issues that are not call 911 right now. These are issues that need support and, and help over time that you mm -hmm. can play a role with as a friend, but that there might be a role for others as well, like a doctor or like a therapist or a parent or, you know, whatever, pediatrician, um, mm -hmm. mentor. Like, I, you know, so in the conversation, it, it, if you're the helping person, again, it's reasonable to not be, um, to not have to be the only one who knows so that you're kind of like the sole bearer of this very um, intense private thing that you could say, um, is there anyone else in your life who knows about this, who, who can also help to support you? 
Um, mm -hmm. and, and if there isn't, you know, to kind of brainstorm around that a little bit. And I think it's okay if the person is like, oh my gosh, I'm not ready to tell anyone else, then, then you do need to respect that. Um, again, unless it's like an imminent safety crisis. But beyond mm -hmm. that, really treating their, um, their disclosure about how they're doing with utmost care. Like the last thing that, that you would wanna do is go tell somebody else and it gets back to them and they feel betrayed and they feel like right. it was the wrong decision, you know, to, to disclose this. Yeah. I, I can see that. Um, I, I can, I can see that on the, on the flip side too, of, of when, you know, when you are caring for someone and asking them like, Hey, I'm hearing you're, you're talking about all these struggles and um, are you thinking of ending your life or are you thinking about killing yourself? Um, I think adding that those extra paddings that you mentioned earlier as well of, um, and I ask this as a caring friend and I promise I won't, you know, um, I, I won't like do any interventions that without your consent, mm -hmm. um, like, you know, of like, if you feel like you, you do need help and you do need to call emergency services, I will, I will be there to help you. But for as long as you don't want that and don't feel like you don't need that, um, I'm, I'm here, I'm on your team <laughs> by your side as well. So I can see that, yeah. I can see that for both sides of saying that, Hey, I'm feeling suicidal. Um, but this isn't something I feel like needs emergency intervention. So please respect my boundaries around that. Um, and yeah. then also, yeah. also sharing those boundaries as a friend, because boundaries are where two sides meet. It's not necessarily a one-sided demand. <laughs> yeah. I think the way you just said all of that as well is, is totally on target. It's like, it's clear. Um, it's kind of defining where you are and providing those reassurances. And I know it is really hard, especially for younger people to be that direct. Um, you know, you, it's, it's, it, it's not necessarily a skill that, that, you know, people learn that at some point along the way, hopefully, um, yeah. because we, we are, I mean, I, I think it just goes to, to me, this issue of like how you get your needs met and how you ask, um, how you let the people around you know what you need. Um, you know, it, it starts, I think, with working on that sense of yourself as a person who is worthy of love and and caring. Mm. And and if you really believe that and, and want that, then there are ways to more effectively um, you know, navigate through relationships that, that is really, it does start with communication skills. And, and so this is something you're like, oh my gosh, I don't even know where to start. I don't know how to work on this. It is hard to do it on your own. I think if you happen to have like a trusted person in your life who is, who is into this kind of thing, you can kind of like navigate it together. Mm -hmm. But in my own personal experience, it's way easier to accomplish it with a therapist who is just there to help you kind of develop those skills and, and work on those issues. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And um, uh, the the believing that we are all worthy of love and care and healing is mm -hmm. so beautiful, but also <laughs> such a journey, isn't it? <laughs> it is, and it is for all of us. And I, yeah, so I, I, I never wanna come across as if, you know, there's this, state of perfection or, you know, it, it, it is, life is messy. Our mental health is super dynamic. It's interacting with our life and the stressors and the influences around us, as well as our own it, mental health is interacting with our physical health as well. It is part right. of our human physiology. Our brain is an organ in the body. So these are issues that are always like, like you said, they're a journey, but we can take steps in a certain direction rather than kind of keeping right. on the same path. Right. All right. We have a lot of questions in chat. So okay. do you mind if we get to some of them? Yeah, that's great. Um, I'm probably going to do these a little bit out of order y'all. Um, let's see. Um, so Anog 47 asks, how do we explicitly discuss consent around disclosure and how do we practice that? I'm guessing this is between, between the friends and our friend conversations. Uh -huh. um, okay. I think that's a great question. And do you think um, that they mean consent to even like 
engage in the conversation or consent to bring other people into the conversation because I, I hope I've covered that that latter piece mm -hmm. like basically you're not going to bring other people into the conversation <laughs> if it's around these very private issues unless you explicitly um, talk to the person about that but if mm -hmm. it's around like you know consent um, I mean what do you think Jay what do you think they mean or maybe they can clarify um I was I was thinking just around um, like uh, if if someone feels like maybe they want to like reach out to um, reach out to someone else for help um, of like how how to negotiate that with a friend that's mm -hmm. how I was reading it please correct me in chat if I'm wrong mm -hmm. um, oh, oh uh, they had a follow up I, I hope this is the same question I'm um, <laughs> finding what what does have meaning and provides motiv motivation for the person and connecting with that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. For example, some of us don't feel the, quote, need for, quote, love and caring and healing, but do have a need to maintain an ability to accomplish things or mm -hmm. help other people. Yes. So identifying those those types of needs. Oh, that's, that's really a great point, that people... Right. Our value systems can be in very different places. And so so part of that caring conversation that I'm sorry, we, we really didn't even get into this part of it, <laughs> is the listening part is actually trying to then you're trying to draw out from the person or give them the space to just share exactly like what has been going on. Mm -hmm what what is distressing to me or or like what are my priorities my values my goals and um so yeah that that caring conversation can be all about them and and kind of like as the friend i think coming at it with this sort of like um supportive curiosity like you're there to support them but you can only support them or support them best if you understand some some aspects of what they're going through mm -hmm. or their value system. So it's really giving them that space. So I really, I really appreciate um, them making that comment that it is, it's very much centered around that person's beliefs and needs. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, I mean, all, all those things that you just said, like, you know, these value systems and stuff, I, I think that's what makes it so, so special and so powerful to have, um, to to have a kind of foundational friendship with someone and talk about these things you know i think it's going to be a different space than with a therapist or with a, an authority figure um yeah. like you know maybe someone in your school or someone um in your religious spaces it's, it's going to feel a little different mm -hmm. to talk about it with a friend and with a peer um because often often we might kind of already know some of the at least some of these things um in terms of value systems with each other and and what we care about and and what really what has always driven us you know in in our friendships and in our lives in general um yeah. thanks for answering that one um there are a couple of hotline questions that i kind of just want to rapid fire through okay. um and i can answer on behalf of the games hotline and then you can share kind of anything you know sure. about yeah. um other especially suicide hotlines um Definitely which might work a little bit differently than we do. Um, so Anag42 again asks, is it okay to call hotlines just to check what happens when we call? So we know in advance when for when we might need to in the future, or is that considered a mis misuse of resources? No, I, I think um, if you're curious about that, I. I think that's a great idea. You might also see stuff, you know, on their websites that addresses mm. this. I mean, I will speak. Um, I'm I'm the um, chair of the clinical advisory for the crisis text line, and so I do know that under 99.9% .9 of circumstances, they will not engage um, what they call active rescue, meaning finding local. Um, police or others to do like a well check with that person. They are purely interested in supporting the mm -hmm. individual through that um, kind of the intensity of that moment. But um, so, you know, I think probably what you'll find from most of them, and maybe you can speak to this, Jay, in terms of the games hotline, is that there really is not a, 
a, a plan in place to engage anyone other than the person that they're supporting on that call, unless there is reason to believe, and I mean really, you know, hard facts reason, <laughs> that there is a current threat to their or other safety. But that's that's a very, very rare moment because we're we all can experience lots of forms of distress and 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 not be in, in jeopardy in that moment in terms of safety. Yeah, definitely. Um, that actually really blends in with another uh, another question that I think we've kind of just answered. Um, from Down DD, which is, do hotlines have the obligation slash resources to contact authorities if they suspect an imminent suicide? And so, yeah, that's that's what we kind of just talked about. Um, I think it varies from hotline to hotline, um, but for the most part, um, like Christine was saying, it's um, they're really there to just support you. Um, did we did we lose Christine? <laughs> Uh -oh. Are you still here? Oh, you look frozen to me. Oh, okay. Someone will let me know if there is an issue. Um, but but yeah, um, like as like I was saying, um, I think different hotlines have different um, measures for that. I know for a fact I can say for the games hotline, um, we don't initiate contact with law enforcement um, unless it's requested by the person that we're texting with. Um, and so, you know, in the case that someone um, who is texting us asks for help with, hey, I want, I want the police to come, I'm not feeling safe, um, we can either be, you know, they're texting with you while you call them yourselves, um, or we can call them on your behalf with your consent. But we at the hotline will never contact the authorities um, without without that consent. And I know places like the Trans Lifeline also has that policy. Um, and the Trans Lifeline is a uh, is a suicide hotline specifically for transgender people in the US. Um, and then other suicide hotlines, I think, have uh, varying levels of um, kind of assessing for risk, um, which they will use to uh, determine how they want to proceed. But for the most part, um, they like suicide hotlines exist to support folks and exist to, mm -hmm. to talk to people about suicide. And they have a deep understanding of what what these feelings look like and, and mean. And they understand so much of what Christine was talking about earlier around, um, you know, like suicide in itself doesn't necessarily mean danger. Um, it just kind of means that there's there's something maybe hard or painful going on. And so um, I think if that's something that uh, folks feel concerned about, even with the games hotline, um, asking is always welcome. Um, yeah. would, would you, is that, does that I reflect agree. kind of what you know about suicide hotlines? Yes, I totally agree. And um, can you hear me okay, Jay? Yes, I hear you okay. fine. Okay, good. Um, it, and it's also maybe important to bring up the fact that that now that the issue of um, diversity, equity, inclusion is on everyone's minds, that has very much come to the fore um, for many of these leading you know, national resources and hotlines. So that the awareness that for certain people, and particularly people of color, getting the police involved with a mental health situation is 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 can can really be a deterrent um, mm -hmm. to getting the help that they need. So that that's also what I was partly um, alluding to when I was talking about the fact that communities are we need to advocate for them, give them the resources to develop. Um, you know, culturally sensitive and appropriate mental health crisis resources so that it's not even law enforcement that's coming to bear right. on these mental right. health crises. That really is a is a is a is an odd sort of mismatch <laughs> that is based on kind of an archaic system that that we're still living with, but needs changing. Right. Right. That makes a lot of sense. So definitely ask questions. Um, if law enforcement and something you're worried about. Um, and also, you know, I would say, you know, calling just to check out a hotline, um, even when you're not in crisis, totally an okay use of that resource, because I think okay. that that um, providing that information and, and 
allowing a hotline to let you know what the space feels like and what what it might look like when you text in or call in um, is definitely a part of part of that hotline's work. So uh, I, I really encourage that as someone myself who needs to take a lot of little steps before I can kind of get to where I need. Um, I know a lot of times I have like, if I can't call quite yet, I'll like just dial the phone number in and close it out. And that'll just be step one. Um, and then maybe the next time I'll dial it and let it ring once and then hang up. So uh, if you need to do any of these types of things with a hotline, I, I think that is that is perfectly okay. Um, and know that the majority of people who use those hotlines are not in a suicidal crisis. They're just working through mm. other other kinds of things in their life. So right. it's completely appropriate to call them actually for any reason. Mm -hmm. um, another question we got in chat was from Down DD again. This was a while ago, uh, but is there a link or, or any place to see if my area has mental health crisis resources? what government department is likely in control of that? So how, how what's the easiest way for someone to kind of find that information about their locality? Oh boy, that, <laughs> that um, could be a challenge. Mm. What I would do, let me think about this, um, if I wanted to figure that out. Um, what I would do is, um, well, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services um, Agency, is our federal government's mental health uh, and substance abuse like resource. Um, so you could you could start there. There is also a very, very special group that um, is working at the forefront of this as we are actually at AFSP. Um, they have a, a, a resource called Crisis Now and they have started building these mental health resources in various communities around the country. So I will say it's like it's in such evolution right now. And um, this issue at, at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, where I work, is one of our top policy priorities moving forward. But it's, it's pretty... Um, it's like evolving and quite new. So just to, to say that you can expect... Um, you know, probably, hopefully, fingers crossed, a lot of positive change um, so that hopefully there's coming a time soon when every community is going to have that. But, you know, I'm sorry for that long winded answer. It's it's kind of a hard, a little bit trickier to find. There's not like a good map resource that I know of yet. And if and if and if there were, it's going to probably be piecemeal because it hasn't been all pulled together yet. Mm -hmm. I, I'm crossing all my fingers for that shift because I think that is so necessary yes. in, you know, providing like public health services of like actually responsive and responsible mental health support to all of our communities. Right. I will, I will tell you some of the communities that I know have it, some in Arizona, San Diego, in the state of Washington, um, and, 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 and others where what it looks like is um, a mental health system mm -hmm. that is sort of side by side with law enforcement. So, so depending on what comes into 911, a different kind of like member of the team gets employed, deployed to that situation. And there are also really cool models where a mental health clinician is paired up with a law enforcement unit, which might sound kind of weird, but they they are they're with them then all day long. Mm -hmm. And what's happening there that's so beautiful is that a lot of situations that police get called into aren't necessarily obviously mental health on the surface, but when a person is in distress or is becoming, um, you know, psychotic and agitated, the the law enforcement might assume that this is criminal behavior, but the mental health clinician can see that there's, it. right, that there's actually a, a, you know, reason for it that's not necessarily related to, you know, criminal behavior. So that, that integration of law enforcement and mental health expertise can actually be a really good thing too. That's really interesting. I hadn't heard of that. That sounds like a pretty good, um, stopgap for, for the, for the meantime, until we figure out some of these larger mental health uh, resources to have that kind of expertise built in um, to that thing. Um, as we're, we're getting into kind of the, the last maybe 20 minutes of the show, I kind of want to reorient us back to um, 
back to this idea. We've talked a lot on the show about community care over self-care. And I think there's so much of that that we're talking about in this conversation awesome. when uh, when we talk about supporting our friends and, and all of that. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, how to start these conversations and um, kind of maybe some different resources that we can point to like hotlines or therapists or um, other community resources and even emergency response resources. But now I kind of want to want to I want to get to actually what we were, what we opened with, with uh, how this pandemic, we're kind of in this weird middle part where there's not quite an end in sight, but it's also not quite the start of it, um, of what if we're in that place in a conversation about a friend we care about, um, or our own even, um, but let, let's start with, um, we have a friend, they are suicidal. They have been suicidal for a while. We've started conversations with them. We've offered them resources like therapy or community, like community spaces or uh, calling a hotline. Um, but maybe, maybe it, it feels like to us that, that nothing's changed or it feels like to us, we're not getting the the easy, easy solution that maybe we were hoping for, that we could just talk to someone and they would get into therapy and it would be better. What do we do with those feelings in ourselves of, cause we, I'm guessing we don't want those frustrations to come out to the other person. Um, but, but yeah, sometimes friends are just help resistant and their struggle, the struggles look like cycles to us. And so how do we take care of ourselves in our own reactions so that we don't take it out on them? Yeah, this is a really great topic um, because many issues in life, and including mental health um, and, and suicidal kind of crises, um, many times there there is an ebb and flow to them over time. And, and it's not just, a, like you said, a short-term thing. And so in, in my mind, this is an issue of sort of growing our own sort of healthy boundaries around relationships, because it, it's really, if you think about it, not just about the mental health topic, like everyone's got their stuff, um, their, their issues, their um, struggles, their imperfections, their weird habits, whatever, that when, when, you're, when you're friends with somebody, and particularly if you're close friends or if it's a significant other, you... Um, you learn more about that individual and how they operate and that there are, there's no such thing as the person who's like just free of, of any of this, these kinds of human issues. And so I think first and foremost, it's, it's, you can acknowledge that they're not perfect and I'm not perfect. We all have our, you know, our stuff that we carry. Um, but the, it also is, is a, a reminder um, that they might come to a point when you have to remind yourself, but that doesn't mean that I must, and fill in the blank, you know, whatever it is, mm. take care of them, feel responsible for that issue, have it ruin my day if, um, you know, if their mood fluctuates. Like those are the, those are the skills that are, um, that actually need to be practiced because we're such social creatures. If someone we love is feeling down, of course it's going to affect us. And that's normal, that's healthy. But it's when there's this kind of intensity to, um, you know, kind of cycling round and around and, and you feel like um, it's it's more than you can give. I think that is that is reasonable to look at that and think through that. And, and like you said, I think probably to work that through your decision-making process with another trusted individual. If you have a therapist, then it's per, it's, perfect for a discussion in therapy. But right, because to have the discussion with the person, I mean, certainly once you've you've come to your own feelings and, and thoughts about it, then absolutely it needs to be discussed and and um, you know sort of negotiated with with the person themselves. But to to hash it all through is going to get really wound up in you know, if they're the ones feeling suicidal and distressed and now you're saying, well, it's it's affecting me and it's a burden for me. Um, that, you know, they, they don't necessarily need to work through that part of it with you and they've got their own load to carry. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's, um, these are tricky issues. Friends are not supposed to be each other's therapists per se, right? We, we get to draw the line with, um, what is 
comfortable for us in a relationship that should be ideally give and take, you know? Right. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, I think those are all such important things to keep in mind. I wonder if, um, you know, we, we've kind of been talking about this, like one and two person conversation, Mm -hmm. but especially when things maybe, you know, maybe, maybe you are kind of just feeling tapped out. Maybe like when you're starting to feel this, feel like it's a burden, you know, that's, I would say that's not a great, a great sign for your own kind of capacity Mm -hmm. um, to, to no one's fault. But uh, I wonder if, you know, maybe that's a sign that you need to kind of tap someone else in and reach out to maybe do the work of reaching out to another person that, you know, cares about them and say like, hey, um, maybe without, without disclosing anything, you agreed not to disclose, but saying Mm -hmm. like, I think our friend is struggling. Um, I encourage you to reach out to them. (laughs) Yes, yes, I agree. And it could, people do this in all different ways too. It might be that, um, you know, depending on the circumstance, it could be that you're, uh, if, if it's, let's say it's two high school students in particular that, that are the, the, the dyad there. Um, well, the helping friend, their parent might have a relationship with their friend's parent. So there are, there are different ways to kind of engage more of that supportive network around the person rather than you feeling like it's all on you. That, that's, um, that shouldn't go on for a long, long time that way. That's kind of setting up for some, you know, some issues in in the relationship that become either enmeshed, codependent, where you're, um, you know, not working on your own. Look, again, everyone has their issues. So this isn't a matter of a black and white thing of, oh, you have to be two perfect people. No, that doesn't even exist. Um, But kind of, you know, supporting each other, but also having your own independence. Um, is is the ideal. Mm-hmm. It had it, your the conversation got me thinking too about the larger space of like when you're in I suppose like a gaming community where you're all like on a stream with lots of other people and how um, how different um, you know things people are are posting or saying can. Um, can be can add value to the community's sense of like either whatever supportive you know togetherness or it can be like a teardown that makes it a more like unsafe place mm-hmm. and so I've wondered about that too if there if if especially people who game a lot that you must become very like have your radar up for like where when it's going in wh- whichever direction and also to make some choices around what kind of influence you want to be in that space right yeah i i mean i think all of those things um make such an impact on the way that a community space feels you know yeah. um and de- definitely a larger conversation than we have time for here <laughs> about games exactly. and and how we treat each other in games but um i guess kind of just just to wrap up, uh, I would love to hear any final thoughts you have on um, on just what are some what are some really important ways that as a community, maybe as a friend group or as um, as just a community space, we can, even before moments of crisis of of suicide um, or you know, even even before getting to that conversation of suicide, um, what are some good practices and and good uh, values that we can kind of instill in our communities to make sure that when someone is feeling suicidal, that this is this feels like a safer or more comfortable space that they can talk about it. Yeah, those are that's a great way to frame it. I think there's lots of things that any one of us can do that, that, um, that first of all, like, I think we need to realize that as a member of a community, even if it's a large community, your voice has a lot more influence than you might realize. And especially Mm -hmm. if you're using it in, in one of the extreme directions, you know, for extreme negativity or as a, as a positive encouragement. But what I've noticed in like friend groups is that if one person is able to start talking about, um, 
either a time that they struggled in the past or something that they're going through now and is able to do it in a way that isn't necessarily a crisis, but it's just like a more vulnerable, um, you know, statement of what's going on. And, um, and, and the friend group will, of course, probably very naturally rally around, offer to help, you know, how, how can I support you? Um, that is all fantastic. If anyone also then role models and says, you know, I'm going to see a therapist for the first time, mm -hmm. or I have been in therapy, that is a very powerful statement of how the person framed it and how the community reacted either in a neutral way or in a positive way will set, uh, will, will set the tone for everyone who heard that to know that this is a group where mental health is like part of part of the conversation and where it's not stigmatized to talk about these issues or going to therapy. Like I think just those simple like steps. Um, and the last thing I'll say is if somebody is going through a tough time, don't underestimate just the simple um, check-ins and text messages uh, and reach outs that that can have a powerful effect on that person's well-being, mm -hmm. and especially when they're in distress. But there is the most like mind-blowing research that shows that for people who have recently attempted suicide and are coming out of the hospital, either, either an emergency department um, or a, an inpatient psych hospital unit, that simple postcards, text messages, emails, and phone calls, and there are like 14 studies that looked at that versus people who came out of the hospital and got just treatment as usual, that those postcards, it's called the postcard study, um, it reduced their likelihood of attempting suicide at a later time by upwards of like 60, 70%. Wow. So it's kind of like, you know, are you kidding me? Just like simple messages, <laughs> but we're, we're social like that. So it means something to us. So you, you can be that kind of person just by reminding yourself like, oh, I wanna make sure to follow up with them and just say, hey, thinking about you, how's it going? You know, let's, let's get together sometime, whatever it is, just messages of support and care. Yeah, I I love the vision of of building all of those things in even before a flashpoint or before mm -hmm. um before a crisis moment, you know, because I think that yeah, that's those are those, that's a really phenomenal statistic. I wouldn't have expected mm -hmm. that and um and I I think yeah, that that really shows how powerful these little, you know, little quote unquote little um acts and and uh moments can have on on each other and because, yeah. cause yeah, we are, we are so social and we are, we are all part of, part of something, you know? So we really that's are. Really yeah. Yeah. It is. It's, it's crazy to think about, but you know, when you get a text message from a friend, you know, there's this like feeling that comes when you're like, um, when the alert pops up. So we need that. We're, we're much more in a way like hardwired for those social connections than we even realize at, at a very kind of deep human level. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much for being on this conversation. I feel like I could talk to you so much more about so many more little things that came up here. Um, but this this felt really good, um, and it's I think such an important important thing to talk about um, as as we are wanting to build healthier communities and communities where where we can um, really like be be beacons of support and um, light for each other and for ourselves. Uh, so thank you again so much, Christine. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about where folks can find out uh, more about you, uh, your work and all of that? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so, right, so I'm Christine Moutier and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So you can go to afsp.org and if you want to learn more about mental health, about you know how to play a role in preventing suicide, um, there there are lots of different ways to to learn and also to be involved um, in this sort of movement of suicide prevention. We have chapters across the whole country. So if you're really interested in like walking in and out of the darkness walk or mm -hmm. um, learning more about where your local chapter is located, that is all on our website too. And some of the things we talked about, about how to have these caring conversations, as you had mentioned, are um, there, maybe they're posted there in our 
um, our hashtag real convo campaign. There's a guide that actually gets into like some of the brass tacks of what those conversations can look like to give you actual language. But um, it's really just such a pleasure to speak with you, Jay. You have such a wonderful way about you and, and to be able to, to reach your community means a lot to me. So I hope it was useful and, and helpful to some people. Yes, um, the the Real Convos uh, guide is linked in the chat. Um, I'm sure the bot will post it again sometime soon. Uh, but uh, this was this was really really this was really precious. Thank you so much, and thank you to all of our mods for keeping this space friendly as always. Um, and thanks to everyone for turning for tuning in. You will be able to watch the video a recording of this anytime on the Games Hotline YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash games hotline. The Games Hotline is a free resource for everyone. As a reminder, uh, if you want to help us keep it that way, please head over to gameshotline.org slash donate and share a few bucks with us if you can. And join me, join us all next week when we'll talk to Jenna Jacobs about fitness, motivation, and revitalization through movement. Thank y'all. Take care.